Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dennis, for inviting me. Um, I'm uh, always really happy to be here because I enjoy so many presentations that uh, you guys put together. I was just saying I watched Dennis's part two of the receiver uh, thing, I, uh, slide, uh, slide presentation. I watched uh, Marty Wall's uh, presentation recently that was really interesting. Anyway, a bunch of great stuff. So um, this presentation that I'm going to walk through here is a project that I started a few years ago uh, that was to build a radio trailer. And so I'll give you a little bit of the buildup um, about why I did this and a uh, outline of all the bits and pieces that went into it and take questions as we go. So, um, so I'm George, KJ6VU, a little bit of background, licensed back in 1972, seems like yesterday, but <laughs> it's been forever. Um, I do a lot of uh, building. I do more building than operating, so I'm one of those. Uh, mostly building repeater systems, uh, portable radios, uh, HF, you know, a lot of circuit design, stuff like that. I'm also the co-host, uh, well, actually the host now of the Ham Radio Workbench podcast. So I don't know if any, but you, any of you have heard it, but you can get it on your podcast player. Uh, lots of interesting and fun topics and guests over there. And I also have two little radio companies, the uh, uh, antenna company called Pactenna. We make portable antennas for ultralight uh, mostly HF and a little bit of VHF operating, and also a company called Sierra Radio Systems making control systems, mo mostly for repeaters and site controllers. Uh, my my first station back uh, 50 years ago was a uh, fabulous receiver, a Drake R4B. Dennis probably has 18 of them in his in his uh, Art One, only one. That's a shock. Um, uh, and a uh, paired with a Johnson Viking Ranger too, which weighs about three pounds per watt. If you want to uh, go by a, a typical rating, uh, that thing was was a beast, a 75 whole watt CW when I was a novice. And uh, today I've got uh, a whole bunch of radios, but my main HF radio is a, a flex, and I got a whole bunch of portable radios and other stuff uh, in between. So uh, the, the Workbench podcast, quick plug for that. Um, if you uh, are interested in hands-on radio stuff, that's what we focus on. We do two to three hours <laughs> every episode. The plan is one, we tend to do more. Uh, and it's all hands-on radio. It's it's technically oriented, whether you're a beginner or advanced in a topic, and we cover all kinds of things, everything from uh, designing and building your own CW radio to uh, programming microcontrollers and designing circuit boards, um, and uh, how to pick the best uh, $400 backpack. Just about anything you can imagine, uh, we, we try to cover it. We've just crossed over our 200th um, episode, so there's lots and lots of topics. We, we're really lucky. We have a bunch of great co-hosts along with me and uh, also fantastic guests. So uh, please check that out. Okay, so now we're going to jump into the radio trailer project. So one last check here, Dennis. Uh, do we have the agenda slide up there? Oh, good. I just want to make sure. Sometimes I, I, I forget to click the thing and I'm talking about a slide and it's, it's the last slide. So, okay, let's dive into the whole radio trailer project. Um, the first thing we'll do is talk about why did I focus on this project, the details, the build, all the radios, antennas, electrical system, and other useful stuff. And lastly, the uh, current uh, enhancements that are uh, underway. So why a radio trailer? Um, my club in the Bay Area, in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, does field day every year. And for 20 years, I was the guy who brought most of the gear, and that got pretty tiring to load up your vehicle with lots and lots of gear, haul it to the site, set it all up, tear it all down, haul it all back, unpack it all. And I got tired of doing that. And so I wanted a way to have everything pre-positioned somehow and be able to just uh, go somewhere, set up in a few minutes and operate. Uh, by doing that, I thought we as a club would do more events. And, um, and also it'd be a lot less wear and tear on all of us. And uh, that was the whole idea. And so I zeroed in on the idea of a trailer for that, uh, for that purpose. So um, let's take a look a little bit at the build out of the trailer. We'll start with the basic bones of the trailer. So I looked around at a lot of different uh, trailers and uh, this is what I eventually settled on. It's a, a 10 foot long box plus the tongue in the front. The thing about uh, this trailer that uh, really struck me is that it's big enough to be comfortable, but not so big that you couldn't tow it with a, a regular vehicle. So I don't have a big truck or a big SUV. I just have a kind of a crossover 
uh, type of SUV with a class three hitch. So I didn't want something too big. So one of the thoughts was, you know, how long do you want to make this thing? Uh, how many axles do you want? And I just didn't want to get it too oversized. I also found uh, this kind of trailer that has a higher vertical elevation than most. A lot of these trailers are made for things like landscapers and other folks hauling stuff. And um, I wanted something tall enough that you can stand up in. I'm six feet tall and I want to make sure I could stand up and walk around and be very comfortable in the trailer. So I found this one that was a little bit nicer than the typical white utility trailer. I kind of like the coloring and and um, the look of it, and it was taller than normal. So that was a good fit, and also the box wasn't too terribly long. So it's six feet wide like most, 10 feet long inside, and uh, it came with, the, with plywood paneling, a roof vent, a side door, as you can see here, and barn doors on the back. And uh, I paid extra to have them custom fabricate a roof rack, and the roof rack is basically six posts with uh, three cross members going across the top of the trailer that I could then mount things like solar panels to. And it also came with a pair of roof stabilizers. So pretty basic trailer, but a little bit nicer than, um, than just a uh, landscaping trailer. This is the view from the front. I added a plastic storage box on the front. I tried to avoid a lot of heavy things. Instead of a steel one, I used a plastic one to keep it light. And on the back, you can see the uh, the barn doors. There's a lot of trailers that have uh, a fold down door that essentially makes a ramp, which is used a lot for, um, you know, like uh, little S uh, utility vehicles or lawn equipment, that sort of thing. But I felt that the barn doors would be much more convenient than a, than a flip down door. Uh, inside the trailer uh, was pretty pretty bare bones. It was basically plywood lined and a plywood floor. And the roof is a very thin metal um, covering that, that doesn't have any backing. So it, it's pretty thin. So, uh, so the first thing that I decided to do before I got uh, to the point of actually having fun putting radio gear in this thing, I thought, well, I definitely need to put in a floor to protect the plywood flooring. And I also decided to put in insulation. So uh, I pulled all the plywood off the walls and uh, got that stuff out of the way. I put in a laminate floating floor on the bottom. Uh, so that way it was a nice protective layer on top of the plywood because I know it was going to get wet and dirty and muddy and, you know, I need to be able to clean it up easily. And uh, at one, I pulled all the plywood off because I wanted to insulate the trailer. Uh, when I talked to the guys at the trailer place, I asked them if the insulation would make much of a difference. And they said, well, if you open the doors, the insulation really won't make a whole lot of difference. But if you close the doors, then yeah, it probably will help. So I thought, well, I might as well do it. And if, if, if it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen now at the beginning of the project. So I put insulation behind all of the uh, plywood and also in the ceiling. And I think it does help. I think it does make a difference. And then screwed all the plywood back uh, on the walls. So you can start to see the build out on the right hand side there, the plan view on the left, uh, the basic layout um, was really to, to put in uh, two operating positions was the goal plus to have some storage. But one of the things that I really wanted to avoid in this project is making this a big junk hauler. So the natural tendency for something like this is to have uh, 30 cardboard boxes full of junk and just throw it all in, in a big pile. And that totally defeats the purpose because the whole idea was to have everything pre-positioned so you can show up and in five or 10 minutes, you could be on the air. And if you have to haul a bunch of junk out of the trailer to start with, that just kind of ruins the whole experience. So the idea was to keep the junk um, and the, frankly, the junk on the floor to an absolute minimum. So the basically out on the left-hand side are two four foot desks sitting side by side. And um, that, that really provides a nice work area uh, with space for chairs. So the two operating positions, you can face the left wall. And then on the right-hand side, I didn't want to build out the right-hand side a whole lot because that would encroach on the, the operator positions. But I also didn't want to leave it be a blank wall. I wanted some storage. And so I thought that uh, using some small like utility boxes uh, would be the way to go. So I built out six inch shelving on the right-hand side and got six of these rigid uh, tool cases. These are about 20 inches wide, about six inches deep. And so they sit perfectly on the six inch shelf. And then I, I put a, a retention bar uh, in there so you can just snap in a bar and it holds them in place really well. Um, and you'll see a little bit later how I filled out the rest of the wall there. 
By the way, the batteries and some additional storage are up towards the front, uh, near the front bulkhead. So this is the basic uh, layout of the work position. Everything that I put in here, I mocked up first to make sure that I figured out where everything was gonna go. So I made little diagrams of all the wiring and all the layout. Uh, I didn't really wanna get in there and start sticking stuff in the trailer and finding out it was a bad idea and have to rip it up and redo it. So I wanted a good plan going in. One of the things I wanted to do to make extra space was to, to put little risers on the desks so that the radios and the equipment you would normally have in there are about four inches above the uh, work surface. One of the reasons for that is so that you have space under that shelf for keyboards or paddles or a headset or papers or whatever, so you don't feel cramped. Uh, I saw some people building out trailers where the, they set the radio on the table and they had like six inches from the front of the radio to the edge of the table, which just seems completely impractical to me. So I wanted to get the radios up a little bit, but still make them low enough so you can actually use the knobs at a comfortable elevation. So uh, here you, oops, sorry about that. There's the diagram the, facing the, the wall. And then here you can see the beginning of the build out on the operating positions. These desks that are, uh, that are used here are just four foot long computer desks. You can buy them off Amazon, they're really cheap. And there's a nice metal frame and a uh, kind of faux wood top. And they're, they're sturdy enough for the purpose. They don't get in the way of your knees and they easily bolt in place. So these tables are held in position. They're bolted through the bottom rails uh, through the floor. So there's actually big bolts that go through the metal of the desk through the floor and are bolted in. They're also um, screwed to the wall, to the plywood on the wall. And then you can see the little four inch riser there, uh, the shelves above the, the work surface, and then um, a utility shelf halfway up. And I left the wall pretty open because I didn't really want to junk it up, and put too much stuff in there and also make it too claustrophobic. And up at the very top, I put an extra shelf. Uh, so you could put wiring across the top, like a little wire gantry or putting, put other stuff you don't have to get to very often. Um, towards the front here, I built a, a little two tier shelving unit. So the upper level shelf is really just a little uh, work surface. And then below that, I put in some DeWalt uh, pull out drawers. And this is where I put all the operating accessories that you need uh, to have right at hand. So this is where all of the microphones and paddles and headsets and notepads and pens and uh, some uh, extra you know, bits and pieces go in those drawers. So anything you think you need to get to at the moment's notice is in those drawers. So you don't have to pull out a box, it's just pull out the drawer. Below them, you can see two of the batteries. Ultimately, I put three batteries in the trailer. We'll get into the power system later on. Uh, the, uh, the beige box above that and the uh, big switches is part of the DC power system. We'll get into that in more detail. And then there's a small uh, network rack on the upper left-hand picture here of the picture. Uh, this is the right-hand wall, which is the storage wall, and you can see those uh, those rigid plastic utility cases. Ideally, I would love to have had pull-out drawers, but there's just no way to do it because you only have six inches. And so I went for these individual cases, and each case has a different topic, you know, a different theme. So one case is all coax, another case is antenna components, another case is uh, camping supplies like pots and pans and stuff like that. Another case is uh, connectors and consumable stuff, et cetera. Uh, the, the first way I, I tried to keep these in place is to use some straps, uh, that didn't work. And so ultimately I, I got two steel uh, pipes that are essentially a metal closet rail. And metal closet rail is pretty stiff. It doesn't really bend uh, and it's light, it's pretty lightweight. And so there are, there are two cups on either end, a solid one and a U-shaped one and you just stick the rod in there and then set it down on the other U-shaped little holder. And that rod uh, holds three of those cases in place. And in fact, when I, when I put the rod in there, I, the cases were in place and I snugged the rod up against them. And then I screwed those ends in place. So it's really snug. Um, and it just takes a second to pop it out and put it uh, under the trailer when you're ac actually using it. Um, above that, there's a couple little uh, shelves. Uh, you'll see what gets stored on the, the intermediate shelf. I put five little toolboxes with a little uh, one inch L bracket to retain them. And then the rest of that big flat plywood space is where I store a lot of the antennas. So there's uh, carbon fiber mass and uh, fiberglass uh, pull-up mass, 
uh, and, and a cylindrical like tube that holds uh, uh, some VHF and UHF antennas and the like. So uh, there you can see on that middle shelf, a little roll of, row of toolboxes. Uh, each, again, each one of those has a purpose. One is an actual toolbox. Another one is uh, consumable parts. Another one is a first aid kit uh, and so on. Um, along that uh, face there is also where I put a bunch of folding chairs. Uh, originally, these were the chairs I used inside the trailer, uh, but, but now I, I have two really nice, comfortable swivel office chairs um, that are low profile, but very comfortable that sit in the uh, position at the desks. And then these are just camp chairs I put outside once we get to the location. Uh, here you can see some of the antenna stuff uh, mounted to the wall. So there's a couple of carbon fiber uh, push-up masks. Uh, uh, let me put in a big plug for these carbon fiber masks. Um, you can buy, you can't buy anything more expensive than these things, but they sure are nice. I'll tell you why they're nice. I, I bought a lot of fiberglass push-up masks in the past, and uh, their fiberglass masks are great, except they tend to have a, a lot of friction because the fiberglass is rough and it's very tight in those uh, sort of locking collars. Uh, these carbon fiber masks, once you loosen the collar, they slip in and out very, very easily. So um, if you're setting them up, especially by yourself, you don't want to need a bunch of people to you know, try to pull the fiberglass mass apart. So this, these were great. And they're also very rigid. Below that, you can see a couple of uh, feed points for a two meter and a six meter delta loop. Uh, the plastic uh, cylindrical tube there has a bunch of antenna parts and there's some fiberglass uh, mass. One of the, the built-in antennas in the trailer on the primary position is, is a um, um, ICOM AH4 random wire tuner. And so you can take one of these uh, gray fiberglass uh, uh, mass, bolt it to the roof rack, and it goes up 32 feet, and you run a wire up it. So now you have a 32-foot random wire vertical antenna. So you can operate on any band. It works great on 40 meters. It's a quarter wave, ready to go, plus uh, any pretty much any other band. It works really well. OK, let's talk a little bit about the radio gear. Um, there's a lot of thought about what, what's the best radios to use, and there's a lot of trade-offs. Some radios are really better from a usability point of view, and some are better from a uh, performance point of view, et cetera. So I bottomed out on uh, the following. So the, the, there's two operating positions, and the no normal configuration, the primary radio is the, uh, is the ICOM 7300. That's on the right position as you're looking at the wall. And the left position is the VHF, UHF uh, radio, which is a IC9700. So there you've got uh, HF and VHF, UHF. Uh, one of the reasons to go with the ICOM 7300, uh, they're very easy to operate. There's so many of them out there, a lot of people know how to use them. So there's a good chance that if this is for a club event, uh, people probably know how to use the radio more than about anything else I could think of. They fit very nicely. They've got a really nice display. They're very easy to computer control. Um, you know, all the, the great features about uh, a really good modern radio. The only downside to the 7300 is that um, it, there are better radios from an overload uh, per performance perspective, like a Elecraft K3 or K4 would be better. But um, I put extra bandpass filters uh, in that configuration, so that seems to solve that problem. There's a ICOM 5100, which is a FM uh, D-Star radio, a Motorola 5550, uh, DMR FM radio, and there's also room in the uh, network rack for a 6400. So uh, I mounted my Flex 6400 in there on field day, and I can use the Maestro remote control head to operate the radio outside of the trailer. So we can have uh, one HF station on the air, one VHF station on the air in the trailer, and a third HF station or six meter station somewhere <laughs> near the trailer, wi fi back to the trailer, uh, and uh, on another band. Uh, so the first field day we went to, I was operating six meters off the flex while someone else was on the ICOM inside. And that just worked fantastic. Really happy with that. So this is the, uh, the basic setup you can see here. This is the right-hand operating position. So there's the 7300. Uh, they're bolted to the desk with the mobile mounting bracket mounted to the top of the, of the uh, shelf so they don't move around. Uh, every station has a computer. It's a little uh, Windows uh, PC that you can see there in the middle of the photograph, uh, display on the left-hand side. And then uh, there's a, a DSP speaker hooked up to it. 
Um, one of the things that you want to do is put a choke on every piece of wire in the trailer. Just do it. <laughs> Don't wait to have a problem. Just put a choke on every end of every wire. So I always get, get the question, well, with all the computers and stuff in this thing, doesn't it cause a lot of hash and noise and whatnot? The answer is, well, not really, if you buy lots and lots and lots of ferrite. So on the computer there, there's ferrites on all the cables going in and out of the computer. There's ferrites on the back of the, the PC monitor on the, on the video and on the power jack. Everything has got ferrites all over it. Um, you see a little aluminum strip underneath the shelf. That's uh, a little uh, L-shaped piece of aluminum to keep the lighting from getting in your eyes. Un so underneath that shelf, there are three little disc LED lamps. And th they work great, but it, they're kind of bright. And so you don't want to be staring into the LED lights. And so that little strip keeps you from seeing the LED, so it just shines downward. Every one of those LEDs has a big ferrite choke at the LED. And it's not to keep the LED out of the radio, it's to keep the radio out of the LED. Because the last thing that I'm gonna do is, is hit the paddle and every time you send CQ, have your lights winking and blinking CW and you'll drive you nuts. So there's no way I'm gonna put up with that. So choke everything. Um, also being the HF station, you can see the little black box in the upper right hand corner. That's a bandpasser, uh, multi-band uh, bandpass filter box. So the, the 7300 runs through that box before it goes to the antenna tuner or the external antenna so that you can select which band you want to run. So rather than screw on a bandpass filter for every band, you just hit the button and it switches that bandpass filter in the circuit. And that works just fine. Uh, with that, we have had no, no problems really uh, at field day. Uh, let's see, so here's the VHF position. Gee whiz, it looks a lot like the HF position. That's the 9700 uh, with its computer and display. Uh, also, you'll see between the two operating positions, there's uh, the Motorola XPR5550, and there's an extra set of power pole and USB outlets for the convenience of the operators on the wall in between the two stations. And above the shelf is a larger display. There's a logging computer in the network rack, and uh, this display is hooked up directly to the logging computer. So on either of the operating computers, you'll see the lo typically the logging program. Uh, if you're operating a digital mode, maybe you'll be looking at that, but typically we're using N3FJP as the logger. You'll see the logging uh, uh, table for each operating position, and then we'll put the map of the country on the big screen so you can see what, what's going on overall. Um, after these slides were made, I added another display, a larger one on one of the back barn doors. So when you swing the barn door open, there's already a display mounted on the back door facing the outside. So this way, when we're at a public event, people could come up to it. They don't have to even go in the trailer. They could see what's going on when they look at the map on the uh, uh, outdoor display. This is a, a view inside the trailer, kind of a fisheye view. So um, there's three of us sitting in there. Super comfortable for, for two, not bad for three, kind of cramped for four. So uh, it, it, the, the bottom line is, is 10 feet big enough for uh, an operating trailer? The answer is actually, yeah, it's, it's pretty good. We, we take, we've taken this out on pretty much every field day or winter field day. We just did winter field day um, back in January and it was very comfortable uh, as it turns out. You can see right there, by the way, the, lo the logging uh, software up on the, the HF station display and the flex up in the rack and uh, some other goodies. Some of our operators, this is the first field day we rolled it out a couple years ago. So this is uh, John KJ6K and his son James KG6SKK, uh, each operating one of the, the positions. And that's uh, James checking out the logging on HF. Um, on field day, the band was full of signals, and, and so I, I had to take a snapshot. Man, there's a lot of signals. This is 2021. This is the first uh, time we actually took it out. Uh, another one of our club members, John, uh, uh, KD6JL, so he was operating his own station on an ICOM 705, um, and he was logging back, of course, to the server. So even when he was out on a more of a portable station, um, he can get back in. And this is uh, my setup with the, with the little tablet and the, the maestro, the Flex maestro, and I'm Wi-Fi back into the trailer. So the RF is sitting in the trailer. I'm on a picnic table about 50 feet away from the trailer. That's me attempting CW. 
Um, at field day, at the first field day, we had uh, uh, feral pigs trundling through the field day site. <laughs> so that was a surprise, about five or six of them. And we also had feral hams, so it seemed appropriate somehow. Okay, so let's take a little bit of a look at the antennas. Um, this is a plan view of the trailer. I mentioned there were three um, um, trusses, I guess you could say, mounted on the trailer. So uh, those little horizontal bars on either side, there's a post that holds up that cross piece, and there's three of those. So that gave us a, a lot of good hard points to mount antennas and brackets to. <clears throat> so where you see the red circles in those corners, there are uh, clamps, I'll show you that in more detail, where we could clamp the carbon fiber masts or other antennas to. Uh, so the front left corner and the two rear corners, we could put up as many as three masts. And then in the front right corner, um, we have a, a bracket for a HF mobile antenna, sort of a quick and easy up HF antenna, although we really never use it, uh, but it's there kind of just in case. Then on the other roof racks, we have VHF, UHF antennas. There's actually four uh, up there at the present time, plus a, a Wi-Fi access point for extended range for logging. Here you can see a picture of the, uh, uh, the back right uh, mount point. There's one of the carbon fiber masts bolted to the uh, trailer. So there's a clamp up on the top rack and there's a clamp down on the bottom of the trailer. And uh, it's not even touching the ground. And normally it would just sit on the ground to take the weight off of it, but you can see it's floating. So you don't have to actually touch the ground with the clamps. So that works out really well. Um, for clamping the masts, uh, I did a lot of looking around to figure out what would be the ideal way to mount the uh, the masts. I wanted uh, the theme of this thing is like is do everything as quick and easily as possible. That's the underlying goal. And so to put the masts up and down easily with one person, I wanted some sort of quick release clamping system. And I found these really cool clamps. These are really made for stage production. So if you ever see like uh, speakers or uh, um, lighting effects that are bolted to masts uh, or or what look like tower sections on a on a stage, those are clamped to those those uh, trusses with these kinds of clamps. So the opening uh, it just unclamps and opens up all the way. You stick it against the mast and close it and clamp it down, and they screw tight if you want to adjust the uh, tension. And then there's a big bolt on the other end. So um, I, I mounted one of those at the top and one of those at the bottom of the trailer at three points. So I could put three masts on the, on the trailer. And that worked out exceptionally well. I, I absolutely worked out uh, perfectly for what I wanted to do. Um, here you can see in one of the corners, I, there's actually two of those clamps on the top because next to the HF station uh, mounted to the outside of the trailer is a ICOM AH4 that goes straight to the 7300. And um, if you put that fiberglass uh, push-up mast in the clamp to the upper two uh, clamps, you'll go up 32 and a half feet from the top of the trailer. And there's just a wire trailing up to the top of that, uh, that thing. So you could be on the air on HF in five minutes. It is like really easy and you're on all bands. And for ground, you could use the trailer's body as the counterpoise, or you can add an additional ground wire. You can see here there's a little black wire trailing off the bottom, and, uh, and that's the, the additional counterpoise for the vertical. Uh, the little black box on the side of the trailer is a cable access port. So um, you can see the cabling going to the AH4, uh, plus some flex um, uh, armoring plastic going to other antennas on the roof. Uh, there's also two BNC connectors. So uh, in addition to all the normal antenna stuff that's on the trailer, there's two uncommitted BNC connectors on the outside that get routed to the patch panel. So if you want to on the fly, add some new antenna somewhere outside of the trailer and ha have a way to get it in, you could just connect it to one of those BNC ports and it'll route to the patch bay. Uh, um, here's the uh, HF uh, vertical, the tar heel. Again, we don't really use that. Um, because the bigger antenna works better, so that gets used rarely. Uh, you can see one of the carbon fiber masts here on the right-hand side. It's got, at the tippy top, there's a two-meter uh, loop. Then halfway down, there's a six-meter loop. And then a little bit further down is a cellular uh, Yagi in a radome, because uh, sometimes we have places where the cellular coverage is terrible, and so we want to add a little bit of improved cell phone coverage. 
Okay, inside the trailer in the wall mount uh, um, rack, uh, the very top of that is the coax patch bay. So there's a 1U rack panel with 24 BNC bulkhead female to female pastors. So about half of these are mapped out for radios and about half of these are mapped out for antennas. And uh, the radio and antenna cabling comes in from the back and all the patching happens on the front. So you can patch any radio to any antenna on the fly. It's really easy. There's no way to do that with switches. It's just not possible. So, so hard patch panel is the way to go. So you can see all the red uh, text there are all of the radios and the blue text are all the different antennas and extra uh, coax runs. Um, all of the coax inside the trailer was uh, purposely uh, built for the trailer. It's all RG142. So it's, a, it's double shielded silver Teflon. Uh, if the trailer burns up, the coax will be fine. So, um, so that, that worked out really well. So trying to minimize any kind of interference between the different radios. And even the patch cables are, are all RG142. Um, and uh, this is the Wi-Fi access point. So if you're inside the trailer, the radios are hardwired uh, or Wi-Fi. You could go either way. But once you're outside the trailer, uh, since it's kind of a Faraday cage, the router inside the trailer has you know some coverage outside the trailer, but I wanted a, a longer access point. So for example, if you took your flex or your logging computer and you were like 300 feet away from the trailer, I still wanted to be able to get to the trailer. So putting an outside higher power Wi-Fi AP was uh, a helpful addition. Uh, plus other folks at the site, if we have the cellular radio turned on, then they could actually use that for additional cell phone coverage. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the electrical system. Uh, this is a very simple schematic uh, of the system. The heart of the system is a battery bank. It's a four 100 amp hour batteries. Uh, all of those batteries are paralleled and that goes into a big shutoff. So this is the master battery cutoff switch. The reason is that all of the electronics when they're turned off aren't really. <laughs> so the last thing I wanted was some parasitic current draw on the battery bank that I'm not aware of. And so at the very last minute before the battery is a final turnoff switch. And so there's a way to totally isolate the battery bank. Um, after that battery shutoff switch, there's a breaker. Then there's a low voltage disconnect, although the batteries all have low voltage disconnects built in already, but still the system has an LVD. Um, and then that goes to the right there, uh, another switch which goes to all the loads. So all the loads, the entire trailer come to one big switch. So you can shut off all the loads. And then there's another switch that selects the charging source, and that's either the built-in um, solar panels or a built-in power supply. Um, since, since I built it, the power supply has been upgraded to an IOTA 55 amp um, power supply, which is better than the one I first put in there. And all that stuff is monitored with a Victron uh, Bluetooth battery monitor. And this is really important because um, I'm using uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries. Unlike lead acid batteries, you have no idea what the state of charge is on a lithium iron phosphate battery by looking at the terminal voltage. With an SLA battery, you can measure the voltage and figure out the state of charge, but not so with a lithium iron phosphate. So what that means is you have to have a, a power monitor that looks at all of the power going into the battery system. Once it gets to 100%, as it starts to discharge, it looks at the discharge rate and calculates the state of charge. So it's essentially looking at the power in and the power out to determine what the percent of charge is. So that's really important. Um, I, I'm, I'm very concerned about making sure I don't run out of juice at an event. So I want to make sure that the battery monitor is very, very accurate. So the batteries that I chose for the build are these Battleborn 100 amp hour lithium iron phosphate batteries. Um, the reason that I chose these, they were the best quality batteries that I could find at the time. Now this is back in 2021 when I first built it out and, and picked those batteries. Since then, there's a bunch of other brands that are on the market that are cheaper and probably just as good. But uh, you can still get these Battleborn batteries. I liked them a lot because the quality is very good. I looked at the build quality inside the battery. It's very good. And they're a, a US supplier. And I really appreciate not only supporting companies in the US, but I appreciate the fact that if there's something wrong with it, I can call somebody in wherever they are, Arizona, and say, what's up with this thing with the battery? 
So I thought, well, if I'm going to spend this much money on batteries, I want to be able to make a phone call. Uh, so, so I'm very happy with the with the choice. They've worked flawlessly, uh, so I, I'm very pleased with them. Now, there's two big reasons, three big reasons to go with lithium iron phosphate. Reason number one is weight, because sealed lead acid batteries are just way heavier, and so I wanted to minimize the weight on the vehicle. So this is a step in the right direction, and I don't want to lug around a bunch of big lead acid batteries either. Um, the lithium iron phosphate batteries, uh, their big electrical bonus is that they have a flat discharge curve, which means from the time you put a load on the battery to the time that it's about 90% depleted, it'll have a flat 13.3 uh, or so volts coming out of the battery. That's There's a little bit of a curve, but not much. So that's great. That's a lot better than a lead acid battery. Um, the, the other thing that's really nice about them is they have a lot more discharge cycles. Uh, a high quality lithium iron phosphate battery will have somewhere between three to 5,000 uh, full discharge cycles, which means that you can use these batteries a lot longer than you would use a lead acid battery. So even though the, the price up front is higher, the total cost of ownership over the long haul is actually lower. So, you know, it, it kind of depends on, do you want to pay up front or do you want to pay over time? And plus go through the pain uh, of the inefficiency of lead acid. So there's really no reason to use lead acid uh, for these applications. Now, um, if I were going to do it all over again, I would certainly be very happy with Battleborn batteries. Uh, another brand that I've started to use that I think is just as good is called SOK. Uh, there's probably 100 other brands out there, but SOK batteries are excellent. They come in a metal case. You can get them with heaters. They're about 60% of the price of the Battleborn. So it's pretty significant uh, price sa uh, cost savings. And they come in in 100 amp hour or 200 amp hours. And they're also metal cases, which I really like. So that's something to think about. Um, there's a fellow on YouTube that does YouTube teardowns of uh, these kind of batteries. And uh, I highly recommend that you check out his website. Um, I'm sure most of you know who I'm talking about. His name, Will Prouse. Um, and uh, they're super entertaining. In, in, in the big takeaway is all of these batteries look the same on the outside. They don't all look the same on the inside. And the big difference is that the higher quality, higher price batteries will have appropriately sized cable, an appropriately sized battery management system inside. They probably have high and low voltage or high and low temperature shutdown, which the cheaper ones may not have all those. And the better quality ones are just built better physically inside. They're not just thrown together and, and gooped in place parts. So uh, I think in this case, you really do pretty much get what you pay for. And having said that, the prices are coming down uh, pretty dramatically. So do your research, um, but I would definitely go with these kind of batteries. Uh, this is a view of the electrical panel as I was building it. It's a little rat's nesty, <laughs> but you're not supposed to look inside. Uh, so you can see the uh, uh, all the bits and pieces there, the low voltage disconnect, the uh, the uh, breaker. This is kind of before all the wiring was sort of cinched down. Uh, you can see one of the two uh, solar charge controllers up at the top there at Jenison. Um, and, and those three big switches. So the big switches to the right of the box, uh, the top one is the charge source. So switch to the left is on power supply. Switch to the right is on solar. Switch to the middle is, is disconnected from the charger source. The middle switch is just the load on and off, and the bottom switch is the battery on and off. Um, the two meters you can see there, the square one shows you the voltage and current coming from the solar panel. And the round one is the Victron power meter that's the real critical one that tells you what the state of charge is. The nice thing about this setup, by the way, is when you're buttoning up the trailer and putting it away, before you lock the door, you just glance up at the uh, at the panel, at all the controls, and if all of those three switches are in the vertical position, everything is shut off. You're in the storage mode. So the last thing you do before you leave is like, is everything vertical? Yep, okay, lock up the trailer and go. Uh, the solar panels that are used are from Borg RV. They're monocrystalline, 180 watts. And um, so that gives you pretty good, you know, 360 watts of juice is pretty good. And when I talked to the uh, Genesun uh, charge controller guys, I had two 
big concerns. Big concern number one is noise. And, and I, I've talked with them before and they tout their charge controllers as low noise. It turns out they're pretty low noise. They're not zero, but they're pretty darn good. Um, I added a choke to their charge controllers and that eliminated the very tiny bit of noise that I could hear. So that turned out fine. My other question was how would I handle almost 400 watts in optimum <laughs> conditions um, if it ever got to that with a single charge controller? Because their biggest one is 10 amps, not, not 20. And they said, oh, just put a charge controller on each panel. And I thought, I, really, you could do that? I never thought of that. And he says, yeah, they do it all the time on big, big ships like, like sailboats. They could have, you know, 10 panels and they have 10 charge controllers and it works fine. So that was brilliant. So I put two charge controllers, one on each panel, and you just bust them together and they go to the battery and everything, everybody's happy. Works great. Um, did I say choke everything? I just want to remind everybody, choke your ethernet, choke your DC power cords, choke, choke, choke everything and, and you'll be happy. There's the switches, as I mentioned before. And then uh, back to the network rack. So uh, the, the top one U is the antenna patch bay. The next shelf down that looks kind of like a mess here, it's disassembled, is the uh, server, a, uh, a router, and uh, a, a DMR hotspot. Uh, this has all been redone uh, with, with different equipment, but you get the same idea. And then the remaining four U in that rack is where the flex radio would live. Okay, uh, let me uh, wrap up a little bit before I get to the, uh, the the updates for the trailer. One last topic is what besides the core radio and power and antenna is useful. Having a uh, longer range uh, Wi-Fi access point for stations outside the trailer is helpful. That's a wavelength uh, weatherproof uh, AP that just plugs into the network. Underneath the, the, the stations, uh, both of them have a, a large West Mountain rig runner so that that powers not only the radio at that station, but any other accessories. Now, realistically, we only use like two or three of the, the jacks on each one of these things. But the beauty of this is that all the jacks have fuses and they're right in front of your knees. So if you blow a fuse, you don't have to like crawl around under the trailer or some pull 16 things out. You just get down on the floor and there's the fuse and you just change it. Uh, I mentioned the Victron uh, power meter and also uh, these uh, really nice screens. I got a screen for for the back door and also the side door. You Velcro the screen in place and it, the screens pull off the Velcro and they magnetically close. So if you're anywhere where you might have some bugs, man, it's really nice because when you're in the trailer and the lights are on, you don't want to be, you know, the buffet for all the bugs in the neighborhood. So I highly recommend that. Did I mention ferrites? You should, you should have a, a, a bunch of them. Um, these are the LEDs that went under the shelf. They're little pucks that just screw into the bottom. There's three above each of the uh, operating positions. Um, we also typically went to field day in a location with no cell coverage or barely cell coverage. So we started using a Garmin inReach for texting. That worked out great. Um, since then, we've put together a station just to run Winlink and that works fantastic. So our Winlink station has really replaced the Garmin inReach. So the, the inReach is really a backup to the backup. Uh, the accessory that probably was the most useful out of all of these is a ladder because when you're putting up the antennas, uh, when you wanna to get to the upper clamp, you need to get up about eight feet, uh, seven or eight feet, and it's too hard to reach that even for someone six feet tall. So you need a ladder. So these telescoping ladders that you can get at any, you know, Home Depot, Lowe's, whatever, are fantastic because they collapse down to about three feet tall and they can extend to the higher than the top of the trailer. So no matter what you need to do, these things work great. They take a very little space. Um, one of the conundrums with, with having a trailer is if you go to a site where there's trees, do you put the trailer in the sun for maximum sun exposure for your solar panels and it's hot inside, or do you park under the tree so it's cooler inside and then it kind of ruins it for your solar panels? So one thing that I, I sort of figured out the hard way is having an extra solar panel that you can throw it in the sun is really handy. So there's a um, uh, 120 watt uh, power film solar panel and a, a buddy pole power mini charge controller. And that just plugs in 
in, t in that um, cabinet, the DC power cabinet, there's a power pole jack on the side. So you can take any external DC power source like this solar panel and just plug into the uh, side of the, the case and it works fine. Um, having an antenna analyzer, super handy. Obviously a uh, rig expert is like the easiest one to use. They work great. So why bother looking further? Um, also, what we found was uh, we, we wanted, to, <laughs> wanted to put up an antenna on 80 meters and, you know, I can't have a full size antenna at my old house. So, uh, but it'd be nice to put up a 135 foot wire. So we got one of these pneumatic antenna launchers and it fires a tennis ball over as many trees as you like. And then we just hoist up the 80 meter uh, antenna. It works fantastic and makes a very satisfying sound when you pull the trigger. So, so they're a load of fun. Um, so that brings me to the very last thing, which is uh, what are we doing uh, now for the trailer? So the trailer has been pretty much done for the last uh, two years and I moved from California to Oregon. So that kind of slowed down any progress. Um, but now that I'm here uh, working with a very active club, the Hoodview Amateur Radio Club, getting ready for field day, one of the things that we're going to be doing at field day is deploying a big garden network amongst a bunch of stations. Uh, and it, it goes on and on, but the, the, short of the, the short of the story is I'm converting the network in the trailer to support Arden. So what you see at the bottom of the, the picture there is kind of a cartoon of, of what it will have. So the trailer will have a, a bunch of things in it. It'll have a router running Arden firmware. It's going to have a, a, a Part 15 Wi-Fi AP for non-Arden traffic. So that's the thing in the middle. There's going to be a, a, a panel antenna that, that's for short range connections and a dish antenna because we're going to try to uh, route a signal from our field day site to a, a mountaintop so, to see if we can get into the mesh network from our field day location. So in addition to, uh, to the antenna stuff, uh, the, the Arden build out uh, will have an IP phone, um, a, a backup LTE router, uh, and uh, some PCs, one PC running the logging software and another PC running mesh chat and free PBX uh, on the network. So this is all the hardware that's going in. So uh, Ubiquiti Nano Station um, M5, which turns out to be a royal pain in the neck to program in spite of what everybody told me. If you're interested, we can go into that. Um, and on the far right is the long distance point to point to the mountaintop and that's a um, Microtech um, HP5 dish. Uh, Microtech HAP AC light router is the core router, which is very, very popular and very inexpensive and a CR wireless uh, MP70 LTE modem. So that's uh, all the stuff. Uh, the, uh, the idea uh, is at field day, the configuration will look something like this. Um, I, I'll be there with my trailer at field day and uh, one, of, one of my friends, Garrett, uh, who runs the repeater book website that you are probably familiar with. So after, after I published my uh, uh, video about the trailer build, Garrett saw it and said, I got to build one of those too. And so unbeknownst to me, he goes off and starts building his own trailer. So he has one that's very similar to mine, but it's two feet longer uh, and carpeted. <laughs> so it's very nice. And and so we're we're building out the Arden set up in our trailers to be identical. And so the idea is at field day, we're, we're gonna be able to uh, have both of our stacks on each side of the trailers and then have the trailers linked together, plus providing services to the other uh, logging computers and other users at field day. Uh, plus uh, I, I'll have the, the big dish to gateway out into the uh, public mesh network. And of course, uh, Garrett has to one-up me and put a Starlink terminal in his trailer. <laughs> so we're, we're going to try a couple different ways to be able to gateway out. If nothing else, uh, we'll have at least one Starlink terminal running at field day, which seems like cheating, but, you know, hey, why not? But it's, it's really good practice uh, to do all this stuff because uh, uh, mesh networking, at least here where I live now in the Willamette Valley, is uh, super uh, popular and uh, very desirable with the local public safety folks and the hospitals. So there's a big, big push to do a lot of Arden networking. And so I figured this is a good chance to, to build it out into the trailer and get some more folks in the club uh, up and running on, on Arden. So uh, that's uh, pretty much it, except for the final takeaways. Um, the things that were a surprise uh, by the end of the trailer build 
Uh, one is is do bring an extra portable solar panel so you can put it away from the trailer out out of the shade <laughs> into the sun. Um, 300 amp hours is uh, a, a, just the right sweet spot for a field day weekend, in my experience, depending on what you want to plug in, but that seems to work fine. The Maestro and the Flex together were a fantastic combination logistically. Uh, the ICOM 7300 is a fantastic radio, but having the mobility of the Flex uh, control head is really nice. Um, philosophically, less is more. Uh, don't have don't do the the thing that a lot of us do, which is to think, oh, I've got a big cardboard box full of odds and ends. I'll just throw all that junk in the trailer. Maybe I'll need it someday and put six more of those in there. And I'm sure we could use a pipe bender for something. Don't do that. <laughs> what you want to do is outfit the trailer with what you're going to use, and then have redundant backup stuff to support that. But don't bring a lot of stuff you have no plan for. Do you want to bring a spare HF radio? Sure. Do you want to bring a spare antenna? Sure. Do you want to bring a bunch of stuff you're not going to use? No. So don't bring it. Um, and then lastly, uh, the upgrade to uh, the network to support um, both our ham radio operating events and also some public service events. So that's it. Um, and I'm happy to take some questions. Barry, Barry, you want to bring us up on the on the tech stuff, please? Okay, let me go and see what we have here. Is there a problem with excess tonnage weight with the batteries and toolbox forward of the trailer rack? No, uh, there really isn't. Because if you start with the, the tear weight of the trailer with no load in it, um, at that point, what, what you're really adding to it is a couple of desks and a couple of chairs and a couple of small plastic toolboxes and a couple of radios. And I mean, there's truthfully, from a ham radio station point of view, there's a lot of stuff. But if you add it all up from a from a uh, like a trailer towing capacity, you're talking about you know a few hundred pounds of stuff. So the weight's not an issue. That's one reason to go with the lipo for batteries because they're significantly lighter than lead acid batteries, especially if you look at it from a, a usable amp hour perspective. So uh, 300 amp hours of LiPo batteries, it, LiPo 4 batteries, is like 600 amp hours of lead acid batteries. So that's a huge amount of weight savings right there. The stuff on the tongue, it's a plastic box. It's not a steel box, so that's light. And what's in the tongue box is mostly things like wheel chocks, and the uh, pneumatic antenna launcher, which is some PVC pipe. I mean, I mean, there's really not a lot of heavy stuff in the trailer. So the goal was to be able to haul it with a with a regular vehicle uh, and not have to have a big, uh, you know, big SUV or a big truck. Is the trailer heated or air conditioned? How does air circulation happen? Yeah, uh, good question. So no, it's it's not. There's no built-in heating or air conditioning. Uh, now, I built it in California. I didn't really think we needed it a whole lot. Um, here in Oregon, a heater would be nice. So so what what I have to uh, supplement that is is there's a big box fan, like an 18-inch box fan that runs on 12 volts DC if we need to turn it on. So that, But that's just a portable fan we can stick in the doorway. And I also have a, uh, uh, a gas cylinder-operated portable heater so when we did winter field day it was it was pretty cold it's like in, in the 40s so you know you're all bundled up in a jacket but it'd be nice to have some heat so we put in one of those heaters just sit on the floor and it's fine we're very comfortable um, and there's a vent in the roof so once you open the doors it it kind of loses most of the insulating properties and so you're going to be essentially wind shielded but in the ambient temperature that you would be outside um, if it got super cold, we'd probably pack it in and, you know, and call it a day. But but we've been in, in both, you know, hot uh, summer field days in the Bay Area and also cold winter field day here in Oregon. And it, it's been acceptable. Okay. Uh, AE8GS Gene wants to know what the purpose is of the low voltage disconnect. Okay, so the idea for the low voltage disconnect is that you want to monitor the terminal voltage of the battery. 
And when the battery voltage gets below a certain point, depending on the battery chemistry, it'll start to damage the battery cells. So if you look at lead acid batteries that we all are very familiar with as an example, with a lead acid battery, once you get the battery voltage down below about 11 volts, you know, thereabouts, um, the deeper you discharge the battery, the more you're gonna have a good chance of damaging a cell so it won't fully charge again. And so what you really want to do is, is like an SLA battery, when the voltage gets down to some trigger point, like 11 volts, you want it to disconnect the load. Um, so you don't just take it down to like, you know, have you ever taken a, a battery down to like 8 volts and then you try to charge it again? Sometimes it'll charge and sometimes it'll never charge again. Uh, same thing is true for uh, any kind of chemistry, but that disconnect voltage will be different depending on the, the chemistry. Now, LiPo4, LiPo4 batteries, any good one has a, has that built into the battery already. So in technically, you don't really need a separate one. You can get along with the battery management system board that's in the lithium iron phosphate batteries already. Like the Battleborn battery has it built in, and if it went below its healthy voltage, it would just disconnect anyway. But it's an extra uh, insurance to have one inside the electrical panel. Okay, there's a whole bunch of uh, comments on Palomar kits and Battleborn batteries, uh, antenna launcher. Uh, Paul Tuttle was do you use about an antenna. Do you use an antenna analyzer that can check all of the frequencies? Yeah, so we we have a uh, um, in the trailer. There's a um, rig expert uh, that we use because that's the easiest to use, and it. We, we just have the one that covers the HF bands. I've got a VHF, UHF one, but I don't bring it to field day because that I tune the antennas and you never really tweak them. You, if you're going to fiddle with anything, you're probably fiddling with the HF antenna. So we have that just in case. Mostly that's used for uh, some of the portable antennas we have are uh, some could be assembled on site. The vertical doesn't need it uh, at all, but I have a three element uh, Yagi. And once you put that together, you can adjust the elements a little bit. And so it's nice to have the antenna analyzer. So, uh, so that works out really, really well. Okay. Marty, want, Marty Wall wants to know if the carbon fiber mask is, is it conductive, and if so, oh. what is it on the wire <laughs> vertically? That's a that's a great question and a real rat hole, Marty. Um, is it conductive? It's it is somewhat conductive. Let's let me put it that way. Um, the way you want to think about it, I'll give you the simple answer. Think about a carbon fiber mast as if it were made out of metal and you'll be fine. So uh, would you make an inverted V with a metal mast? Sure, no problem. Would you make a, uh, a vertical wire antenna where you run the wire up along the side of a metal mast? No. So if you treat it like a metal mast, you won't have a problem. Um, unlike a fiberglass mast, so like the, the, the gray one that telescopes out, that's fiberglass. It's totally RF transparent. It's like a ray dome. So with that thing, you can you can have a wire that just runs along the side of it, and it it, it works perfectly fine. But you wouldn't do that with the carbon fiber. So uh, the carbon fiber masks in the trailer are mostly used for uh, loops and yagis, and uh, maybe a support for an antenna that's going away from the trailer, not running up along the side. Now you can run coax up the side. You just don't want to put the radiating element up along the side. Okay. And Paul Tuttle says in Oregon. In July, pa panels put out about 50% wattage. If flat, and almost 75%, you angle them and align them with the sun. And he wants to know what everybody else gets. And in yeah, Michigan, 80% out of any array that is mounted on a 22 and a half degree self-facing roof. And it, it, this is with LG panels with an N-Phase 7 plus Microverter, okay, and they put the yeah. That. I don't. I want to make a couple quick comments. Um, so if you're really doing solar panels seriously, then then you'll figure out what the appropriate angle is at your latitude, and you'll have a way to adjust that, and you'll have a way to position your vehicle to take advantage of that to maximize the amount of juice you're going to capture. Um, my philosophy for the solar panels is make sure your battery capacity is adequate to do everything you want to do with no solar panel. And consider the solar panels to be a bonus. So that way we're not relying on it. Uh, going from Northern California to Oregon, where I live now, it's dicier, right? There's not as much sun exposure. Um, and so that was probably a good plan. Um, 
the, the other thing is I, I don't want to bother with adjusting the angle of the panels and all that. Um, you also mentioned N-phase inverters. These are strictly DC circuits. There's no um, inversion, AC conversion going on at all, um, partly because that's a little bit inefficient and also it's more noise prone and there's really no reason to do it because the, the panels are generating DC, the system load is all DC, why bother? The only reason you'd bother maybe is if you're going to transmit that energy a long distance, but you're not. You're only going, you know, 10 feet. So there's really no point in using an inverter. Jed says he likes the bug screen for the doors. Yeah, the bug screens were fantastic. <laughs> and Fred went from North Carolina once on a way you store your coax. Oh, good question. So the coax that we use... Um, we pretty much standardize on all RG8X because RG8X is a nice compromise between performance and robustness. So it's it's big enough that you're not going to ruin it if you step on it by mistake, but it's not so big that it's hard to use. So we never use RG213 uh, or anything like that. Um, so what we do is is all the hunks of coax are 25 feet long, and they coil up and are inside one of those rigid tool cases that are on the wall. So in one of those rigid tool cases, you can fit six to eight 25 foot lengths in there uh, and a bunch of adapters. And, and that's perfectly fine. Now at our field day site, uh, we're gonna be running some longer runs of coax. The club's got some big cables and whatnot. So we'll probably supplement it with some of that. But for anything that you would do just based on this trailer, <clears throat> um, six chunks, 25 feet each of RG8X is fine. And that all fits in one case. Steve has already made a purchase before the show was ended for something. To do. <laughs> so that's my goal. Okay. And did you and Peter Mason and six ERL? Peter had, RF noise radiating oh, from the panel. Well, hang on, Peter. Hello, Peter. I haven't seen Peter in about twenty-five years. So anyway, what was your question, Peter? He wanted to know if he had any issue with RF noise from the solar panels. No, uh, the panels themselves, no. The only noise was um, the Genesun uh, charge, uh, uh, the MPPT charge controllers. When I installed them, I didn't hear any noise. And I was just listening on 20 meters. Um, and, you know, there's kind of a constant white noise uh, background. And I thought, I wonder how much, it, how much that white noise is like just atmospheric noise versus something coming out of the charge controller. So I disconnected the charge controller and the noise floor went down slightly. I mean, you could hear the difference, but it was very slight. So much so that you would never have known there was noise there, except I disconnected it and I, I heard it go down a hair. Um, so then I, I put a, a ferrite core on the DC cables going into and out of the charge controller and that totally eliminated it. So the answer is specifically for a Genesun, specifically for a LiPo4 batteries, uh, at, a, at, at a core and you're fine. Um, but I can't say that's the case for all the other charge controllers. Okay. And Paul, again, wants to know, does the rig expert analyze all frequencies as opposed to all bands? It just depends on which model you buy. So the there's like five or six models. The, the one that we have in the trailer uh, is HF or HF and six. Um, there's a more expensive one that goes up to two meters and a more expensive one that goes up to UHF. Um, and they're all really, really nice, but they get a lot more expensive. So for, for purposes of the trailer, we really only need it on HF because those, those are the only bands where we have antennas that we would actively tune uh, in the field because we're assembling something. Like I said, a Yagi, where the elements have to be adjusted. Um, but, <clears throat> but we actually don't use it very much. Um, we, we have it there as kind of a safety backup, but we really don't need it a whole lot. Okay, and Robert KG7 WNV has an interesting tip for aligning solar panels to the sun. Get some toy arrows with suction cup, stick one on a panel, and adjust it until it casts no shadow. Yeah, great, great idea. Yeah, I, 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 setting up the solar panels would make sense if you were going to be somewhere where there's you, you don't know if you're going to have any way to charge the batteries. You know, you're out in the desert for a week and you're gonna run through your batteries and you really need to have a tuned solar system, then that makes perfect sense. For everything that I do, um, I have plenty of battery juice to get me through a long weekend. Uh, so I really don't have to rely on the panels at all. So, and, and as it turns out, they're actually somewhat useful to top off the batteries. So that works out okay. 
It's also a light enough uh, trailer so you could pick it up and rotate the trailer if you had to. Oh, yeah. You, you, I mean, if you're on a parking lot, you can literally move the trailer by hand. I mean, it's not that heavy. Uh, so. And Fred wants to know if you use it with Envis antennas. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, we'll use wires um, uh, and, and set them up for Envis <laughs> sometimes on purpose and sometimes because that's as good as you can get. Um, so, yeah, yeah, for sure. Like an Envis dipole. And Dave says that antenna analyzers don't work if someone is transmitting nearby. So for field day, all antenna tuning must be completed before the start of the operation. Yeah, in my experience, it's kind of the other way around, which is that the antenna analyzer is picked up by all receivers. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's great to, to have that all done before, before you start the contest. Okay, and that's everything in chat, Dan, so you can go ahead and do the hands. Holy cow, well, I knew we had a lot building up there. Um, Gene, you want to come on? Cut your hand up there, sir. Yes, I am. Hello, everybody. This is Gene from Glorious Colleen, Texas. Hopefully, everybody's doing great tonight. First of all, this has been a fantastic presentation, George. Thank uh, you, you, Gene. You've given me a lot of ideas that, unfortunately, my bank account can't handle. Now, with that in mind, have you ever been involved with or encountered with, with people who have taken a uh, an older model ambulance that a uh, police department, fire department retired, whether it be the, the cube-shaped ones that we see more about nowadays or the old van-type ones that uh, basically had to like spots for like two patients maybe or one operator and one patient. I think you know, know what I'm saying about Oh, yeah. But sure. converting those into a uh, communications, a, a one-piece communication, mobile communications. I don't have any experience with those kind of vehicles at all. Uh, I, I can imagine that they would be, uh, you know, great as a conversion project. I was talking to a fellow earlier today mm -hmm. who was telling me about his project. He, he has a, I think it's like a retired uh, ENG van because uh, it has a mast on it already. And so he, he bought it for like 2,500 bucks. Um, and so, I, I mean, anything like that would be a, would be a great start. Uh, the, one of the reasons I didn't consider that sort of thing is that I didn't want to get into any kind of um, insurance and maintenance costs with an old vehicle. So I think that that'd be my biggest concern is, you know, by the time you get it and it's got 100,000 miles of, you know, hard, hard road, <laughs> Yeah, you know how how much is it going to cost to keep it running? But the actual conversion of something like that into something like this trailer build would you'd kind of look at doing a lot of the same things probably, depending on what the build out is inside. I have no idea if you would like gut it or if you'd use some of the structure inside and just add to it. Uh, unclear, but um, I think yeah. that'd be a great project. It's just kind of like a project I've been thinking about on and off over the years, and uh, someday when I win the lottery, that that that's I probably won't get a used one. I'll probably buy a brand new one and use the onboard power. Yeah, you, you need and, one of those. Uh, you need one of those microwave ENG <laughs> vehicles that has the pneumatic mast on it built in. Yeah, uh, occasionally you can get one from the uh, news uh, stations when they go remote to a a situation out there. They crank up the uh, antennas and uh, they have a satellite dish on them usually, and they just like point and shoot. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Gene. Steve, you want to come on? Mr. Waterman. Yes, sir. George, great presentation. And uh, uh, you guys certainly have uh, the right batteries in there, in my opinion. Uh, that Dragonfly company makes those battleboard batteries out of Reno, Nevada. And they're the best still with a 10-year warranty and a uh, pretty good discount if you last long enough <laughs> and uh i have a question why would you not if you have an mpp controller why would you not put those things in series and use one controller uh well put the why not put the uh, why not put the in series well if you put the they're 12 volt panels so if you put them in series the the then you're going to wind up with a 28 volt under load well, Circuit. Understood, but that so MPP controller will pull them back down to twelve. 
Um, yeah, I don't know. I never, I didn't really think of that. I, I don't know if that would, um, if it have the current capacity. See, it has, that, uh, it has, uh, if you, if you do that, then you need smaller wiring because you have less current and higher voltage. And, uh, the reason why I recommended that was because of the signal to no the, the noise ratio you have there. Uh, I just, just a thought. Yeah, I, I honestly haven't really looked at that, so that, that may be a good idea. I, I know, you know, of course, the panels you can get are typically 12 or 48 volts. Um, I know you, there are some, like, 28-volt panels. I haven't seen as many of those. And the charge controllers are either, you know, 48 volts or 12 volts. And so I just kind of went with what was what was pretty common. Um, and, and for a 180-watt uh, panel, the, act, the wire size and the IR drop on the wiring is not that bad. So I thought, well, you know. There could just, be other ways to do it, but that seemed like a reasonable a, way. Just a thought. <laughs> yeah, I think if I think if the panels were much, uh, you know, a lot further away, and you're concerned about the the voltage drop on it, then then I think going to higher voltage would make sense. Maybe like there's the point earlier about using uh, microinverters that, you know, you could probably make a case for doing microinverters and running, you know, AC power back, um, as more efficient less loss. Okay. But um, but then you have to deal with the noise. I know you weren't suggesting that here, but you know, I, I think there's other just, things. Just just a thought. Yeah. I, I, what I'm going by is uh, uh, some of the uh, agencies that I work with, they always put those uh, panels in series mm. to get less current and higher voltage. And uh, the noise always seems to be less. Mm -hmm. And that MPP controller will handle the series where the cheaper type of, uh, uh, you know, con controller won't. So uh, that, I just thought I'd put that out. Interesting idea. Yeah. Great, great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentation. Tom, you got your hand up, sir. Go for it. Can I have you heard? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Was that me, ISA? On three W three T D H. Oh, sorry. Okay. A um, couple of things. We experimented uh, with using the West Mountain Radio Rig Runners, and when we were using them in a big hurry, and because we're with the auxiliary communications service with uh, the rigs we're using, that happens. Somebody will plug the small wire into the 35-amp fuse every <laughs> time, the 18-gauge <laughs> wire for something. Uh -huh. uh, yep. So what we did was we put the inline fuses in all the cords, one at each end. And that's so that when the cord gets turned around the other way, as it will be turned around because they're universal power poles, it's still protected against some sort of damage to the cord midline, mm -hmm. no matter which way the cable's facing because there's a fuse at the head end that won't put up with it, uh, no matter which way you turn it around. And then you put all 35s in our case in the rig runner so plug it in wherever you want because it's protected an inch away with a fuse that was chosen for the gauge of wire. Um, and then the, the other thing uh, I wanted to say about air guns, I have 45 years of service uh, before I retired in fire and rescue. Uh, and uh, not for amateur radio use, but some of the people that, that made those air guns made mistakes and got hurt. And a couple of them were serious. So what I would say is they're cheaper than dirt compared to the risk. In the head end of that cylinder, put a pressure relief valve. You can read right on the side of the PVC pipe what it's rated for in service. Put a pressure relief valve that's not gonna allow you to come anywhere near that rated service. And a large one, not a tiny one that's gonna take two minutes to drop, but put a pressure relief valve in there. Uh, we had to fly out one guy for eye injuries, jaw, all sorts of stuff. Uh, not fun. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the other thing is a, there's a, a military antenna called the GRA-50, which is just ground radio assembly 50. Don't let the jargon get you going. But it's adjustable. It's two reels of adjustable, and you can make that up out of almost anything. You don't need a genuine GRA-50. And you run it out, and especially with your tuner already there, you run it out by measurement, see if the tuner agrees with the theory, and make a couple of adjustments. And now wherever you were, you can have it resonant 
where you need to be without any compromise at all, it, especially if you're going to try and sit there and run a frequency. Um, and the last thing is uh, make sure you have an extinguisher on a trailer. Um, and it does you no harm in that situation to have a 10 pounder. Uh, myself, I use a 20 pounder, but that's because I was a firefighter and I'm a nervous Nelly about fire. But a 10 pounder should be uh, perfectly adequate. And if you are going to be using the trailer in forested areas, add a backpack pump. And the bottle is that? Add a backpack pump. It's a five gallon fire extinguisher worn on the back. It usually has a trombone pump, but there are some that have an inboard pump. Doesn't matter. Uh, it's five gallons, and then you drop a five ounce thing of uh, FOS check or similar chemical in the water just before you engage. And you're going to think you're God Almighty against that fire compared with plain water. Um, and you don't want to be responsible for an ignition. And when you're out there in a forest, where would it come from but you? The U.S. Forest Service will chase you for the cost of extinguishment to your grave. They, they don't take it on the chin. When somebody causes a fire by an act of negligence, they're going to chase you for the entire cost of suppression, and they don't get around about it. So, you know, National Park is a little more generous, and the Bureau of Land Management is brutal. So don't play around with that stuff, you know, having a collapsible fire rake and a backpack pump. You don't have to fill it before you're ever going to use it. If you're not going to a forest area, you don't bring it or you don't fill it, you know. So I'm not saying it should always be on board, but if you're going to a forested area, it's a good precaution to take. And always have your 10-pounder there, ABC, uh, because they have the knockdown for anything that's going to be on that trailer, including uh, lithium polymer batteries, the small ones we all use sometimes without realizing it. Any B-class extinguisher will extinguish those. They're really a burning liquid fire because of the electrolyte. So, you know, any class B extinguisher will extinguish one of those if they get provoked into igniting by bad handling or whatever. That's what I had for you. So great points, Tom. I, I want to make a couple of quick comments. Uh, what you didn't see in the trailer and the very back where the the last, where the second desk stops, there's one foot to the end of the trailer. And next to the, um, so in that last one foot is kind of a storage area and there's a, a pop-up sunshade and some other stuff. And that's where there's a big red fire extinguisher mounted to that wall. <laughs> right there so <laughs> we, that we figured out um I, well i made so, that comment for everybody rather than yeah your, your particular... no, but i think but that was like one of the first actually that was my wife's idea <laughs> she <laughs> said good, uh, based on her. the amount of wiring that's in there <laughs> you need a fire extinguisher <laughs> so yeah. okay uh so yeah we definitely and, added that and and be aware that um you know if you get wiring burning no matter what kind of wiring you think it is it gives off some nasty stuff. It crippled like 18 people at the New York Telephone Exchange when it burned. And those were just employees before they could get out of the building, breathe too much of that crud, being polite about it. So don't play with burning wire and cut the power and put a lot of water on it um, because it's just class A once you cut the power. So just drown that sucker. Get it out quick with the doors open. and always have your extinguisher at the door so that when you pick it up, you turn around and you look at the fire and you go, oh, hell, well, you're already at the door. You can leave. <laughs> you, know, you can just let it go because it's not worth as much as you are on any basis whatsoever. So for what it's worth, your mileage will, of course, vary. Okay. Well, Paul, I want to thank you for your patience and hanging in there. Go ahead and come on board. Okay, I was going to say with the cert, uh, folks, we learned a technique for with dealing with fires. What was a two-person technique? So the second person is behind the first person and has a hold on their belt, and the second person is the one that's looking up and around and is kind of the safety person while the first person is putting out the fire. And the second person can also have a second 10 pound fire extinguisher if you need to swap. And if you can't put it out with that, you better get out of there. 
And they used to always ask us at work, where's the fire extinguisher? And I said, well, on my way to leaving the unit, just before I leave it, there's the fire extinguisher, just before you run out. <laughs> okay, go, go ahead, George. Yes. <laughs> what else can you say? That makes sense. Okay. Tom's got his hand up again. Go ahead, Tom. Actually, I don't. That's the thumbs up sim oh, symbol oh. to There's say, yeah, there. I agree. It, it wasn't my hand up. All right. Yeah, that's that it looks yeah, pretty close. Okay, Barry, we we'll check back over in the chat and see what's in there. John N6VEG wants to know what the make and model of the bandpass filter is. Oh, it's a uh, it's a bandpasser too. Um, they were sold through Array Solutions. I forget if it was branded Array Solutions, but uh, the uh, the fellow that owns Array Solutions uh, is shutting down the company, and so it's uh, uh, another company is making them. I think it's something like micro automation or ham automation. Hamation, that's it. Um, so yeah, Bandpasser two is the is the model. Okay, and now, sir Barry, I'm going through everything now. Every lots of thanks for the presentation, and we're just about up to date. I just some of the groups down here that have trailers like yours that they don't want to clutter have found that getting smaller secondary towable trailers by someone else for all kinds of the junk to hold. That you are always trying to look for and to put stuff in. It'll make the trailer stay a lot neater. Well, if you're like my wife, if you got some, well, my wife, heck, I'm almost as bad. If there's a spare, a place to, that's bare, it's going to have something there. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Uh, before I forget, sir, George, after we get done here, would you send me the slides on this? On this oh, part. Dan, I, I, I sent it just before the event, so you should oh. have them already. Okay, cool, cool. Anybody else got anything? George, this has been great. Anybody else got anything? Paul wants to know what frequency the bandpass filters are for. Yeah, they, they make them in, uh, there's two different models. There's a uh, 10, 15, 20, 40, 80, I don't know if it does 160 model. That's the one that I use. And there's also a work band version, so 12, 17, 30, and I don't know what else. So they, they come in a couple different flavors. And they also, of course, you can get individual bandpass filters as well. By getting the box with all the filters built into it, you don't really get much of a price advantage. As it turns out, it's really more convenience than anything else. So you don't have to like screw in and unscrew little boxes and pigtails and all that. Um, so it, it, I think if like the way we first did it, we just used those external filters because we mostly ran uh, 20 and 40 for most of our club events. And so we bought 20, 40 and a 15 individual filter. And then when we did the, did the build of the trailer, I thought, well, that's a pain in the neck. I'm just going to get the box. And, um, and, and it's, it's really nice. The only problem with it is you, you'll change bands on the radio and forget to change bands on the filter. <laughs> now you can computer control it, but that's another thing I haven't gotten to yet. You wouldn't do that very often. Dennis, you got your hand up, sir. Oh, yeah, of course. I just wanted to thank George. It was great to, great to have him back here again tonight. And I wanted to make a comment about something you said. If you look off to my uh, right here, that rack full of switches, uh, you were saying, no, you can't use switches to switch multiple stations and multiple antennas. I can run three, three radios simultaneously on HF with this rack of stuff here. <laughs> so... We've done that. Yeah, you know, it's I, all switches. I, I, well, but if if you if you do the the math, <laughs> depending on the permutations you want, it's now, a lot. <laughs> but the the other consideration actually was space, because right. um, you know, if if it was like each station would have two antennas or something, then yeah, okay. Yeah. But I wasn't sure what would ever go to what, so the the number of permutations was too high, yeah. and I wanted something very small. And, and so that's a, that's a great, a great way to do it. I do have a patch panel, by the way. It's a small using the old trumpeter. Uh, this is all my low power switching down here using trumpeter, um, mm. uh, the trumpeter jacks. But yeah, George, what a great presentation. Thank you so much. We really, really, uh, you really did a great job. And 
Thank you, Dennis. Lots of thought there. I'm going to be going back and reviewing this because you got some great ideas in there. So yes, yes, I think a lot of us is, and this, you know, we're all starting to get cabin fever. This is getting into March, and we're all waiting, yeah. wanting to get outside and do some stuff. We're going to get us all excited there, George. Okay, Tom, you got your hand up. I'm going to make you the last one here so we can close her out. Okay, on the filters, um, my club made a patch panel with the slip-on connectors. You don't have to screw them in place, and they're kept in good condition. And the filters are on the antenna side of the patch panel, so they're matched to the antenna. Nobody can forget because once they ask for the antenna, they're getting the filter and the antenna uh, for what that's worth. And also the patch panel is what is the first place going into the trailer where all those antennas are grounded. And we're using the surface wire grounding kit surplus from the military because tests done at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds show that they're as effective and in some cases more effective than driven rods. They, they only go in nine inches, but there's a whole bunch of them on the string. And they're very effective protection. And if you're coming in through a panel like that where you've got a grounding window, you've got it all covered. Thank you. What I like about amateur radio, you can try a lot of stuff, what works and doesn't work, and get some ideas. And there's certainly been a lot of good ideas thrown around here tonight. Okay. Unless somebody. One more question. Okay. Uh, from Paul. I don't know about would you put a fuse on red on one end, black on the other end, or use four fuses? I use one on one end and one on the other because that's all you need to have both overcurrent protection and damage protection. No matter where the damage occurs between the two fuses, there's a fuse upstream of it that's not gonna put up with it. And, and that saves all the trouble and cost of putting on four fuses. Now, uh, I'm an electrician. I did electrical work for almost as long as I did fire and rescue work. And so, you know, that's my approach. I've tested it, there's no problem with it. But if you're a nervous Nelly and you don't mind the work, put in four fuses. You won't do any harm, but carry extra fuses because if you do get an overcurrent protection with four fuses on there, you're likely to find that all four of them went at once if you if you get an overcurrent problem. So carry extra fuses if you're going to do that. Okay. Anybody else got anything before we pull the plug? Thank you, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Yes, and thank you, George. Really appreciate you. Oh, my pleasure.